Okay, so welcome to the Midlife Momentum Podcast. I am so glad you're here with me today because I've got a special guest. Her name is Pauline Ryland, aka the Intimacy Whisperer, and she works as an intimacy, sex, and libido coach and educator. And she holds many certifications, including somatic sexological body worker, tantra teacher and facilitator, and a master trainer and practitioner of neuro-linguistic programming, or NLP. And Pauline recently wrote a book entitled Empowered Conscious Sexuality from Prude to Pleasure, which became a number one Amazon bestseller in five categories. And as a transformational coach and leader, Pauline works with individuals and couples around challenges they may be experiencing with intimacy, sex, libido, relationships, and everything in between. So welcome to the podcast, Pauline. I'm happy you're here today. Thank you. Nice to reconnect with you again. Yeah, no, it was good. It, we, we met a couple of weeks ago. So this is going to be really nice to talk to Pauline again. And so we're going to get right into it because I know that sex and This is a big topic for women in midlife, and a lot of us are having maybe a different kind of sexual relationships than we were having earlier in life. But I'd like to know, in your opinion, what is the importance of sexual libido and orgasm, especially in midlife? Because these are things that we don't talk about very often, so I'm glad that you're here today. (laughs) Well, it's important at any stage of life, really, because you know, we have the act of sex and, of course, that creates a connection with your partner and brings you closer and it can be a physical, emotional and spiritual experience. Uh, But if we separate that out and look at sex as an energy, which it is, it's our life force, uh, if we're not actually using our sexual energy, it's like, well, what else is happening in our life, in our health? And things start to, to... can start to unravel, especially once we hit that age bracket and gone through menopause and out the other side. Uh, that's when you know the aging process starts to hit and we start to have health issues occur. And I really am a believer it's because we haven't got a lot of us haven't got that sexual energy moving, and a lot of women will shut it off. Sometimes consciously and knowingly, and sometimes not. Hmm. So. That so why? Yeah. What would cause us to shut down that sexual energy? That. Oh, look, a, a million different things, you know. Uh, everyone's very different. Like I know for myself, um, when I was in, in my marriage probably about 18 years ago, uh, I wasn't had I had no libido, no desire with my husband and, you know, occasionally we would have sex and I'd be like, oh, my God, that was amazing. I'd be like, why am I having sex more often? And it sort of made me work out that I actually wasn't really connected with him anymore we were really going separate ways and I didn't know that I turned my libido off I didn't know that that was a thing because you know I was just plodding along living life and this is well before I was doing this work but the day that we split up and I told him to leave it was quite a funny story actually I was standing there and I was really you know in the trauma and the drama and the hysteria of what am I going to do now um, and all the things that go with that, having a, a young child. And I started having all these like really weird feelings all around my lower pelvic floor area and and I, I, my genital area. And I'm like, going, I was sort of like, bit, you know, like wriggling around going, what the hell is going on here? And then I realized that my libido came back on steroids in that moment. Wow. I was really horny. <laughs> and wow. I'm like, oh my God. And I had this knowing that, I had somehow I'd switched my libido off and I had this other knowing that I was never, ever going to do that ever again. I didn't know what that meant at the time, but that just was all the things that came to me in that moment. So we're very clever. We switch our libido off in lots of different ways for lots of different reasons. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, that was a powerful story because I think, and I think it resonates with a lot of people. I know I've I've been through that situation similar to yours where I've been through divorce and yeah definitely I know what that feels like to have my libido switched off and I too went through that kind of feeling where I'm never going to do that again I never want to be in that kind of situation again where I'm not yeah. feeling sexual where I I just am going through the motions of life like you said that sexual energy isn't flowing so So what are some of the issues that 
physical or emotional issues that we could have that that are common barriers to a healthy lib- libido and a even orgasm for us in midlife. I know you just mentioned divorce and and you know relationships I guess can be an issue because that's obviously emotional. Um what else can happen at this specifically at this time of life? Yeah, and and also as in 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 regards to switching it off. Yeah, in regards mm-hmm. to switching it off exactly. So what what could cause us to switch off the libido? Oh, how big how big's the list? So many things. Um you know, whether you're 55 or over, it, it can happen really at any age, these different things. So let's say, like, right now I'm working with a woman who a psychologist friend referred her to me. Um, her and her husband went to see him, and she loved him, best friend, like could not imagine life without him, but she's turned around and said to him, I don't find you sexually attractive, and I don't know if I ever had. So he's pretty devastated by that. And so when she came to me for the consult and I was sort of really picking and digging down at what was going on, we I worked out that pre-babies she had a great sex life, post-babies is when it changed. And part of that was she'd had, I think she'd had a difficult birth, but it was a big baby and her husband had a high sex drive and he was like pushing to have sex way before she was ready. So, you know, to stop that constant badgering, she relented Mm -hmm. and had sex, but she wasn't interested, she wasn't ready, and she wasn't really aroused. And so that has started and kicked that in for her. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's one reason. Also, if you have babies and you tear or have episiotomies, um, that can impact you, you know, because... Um, it can be a little bit different down there. It can be tender. You can have internal pain. Internal pain is a big killer for sex because on the, the subconscious level, the brain's going to go, I don't want to have sex. It hurts. So yeah. you switch off. So we have to address the pain, the internal pain, which is something I work with and have great success with. It could be, um, you know, other stresses. It could be things that ha- are not resolved from from even back as your childhood. So it could be sexual trauma or growing up in a family that I don't know didn't have good good family life. Mm. It could be all these sorts of things that somehow sometimes just we squash them down, we bury them, and then bang they they've got to come out at some point. So yeah. it could be those sorts of things that are happening. It could be stress, um, medications. If you're on medications, can d- definitely interfere. So there's quite a lot of things that, that can be a contribution to libido switching off. Um, wow. And quite often when women are single, they switch it off automatically. Oh, no, I don't need sex anymore. It's quite funny. I'm at expos and I talk about sex and people walk past me and I'll just, like, I've got to muck around with it and have fun with it. And I go, so, hey, how's your sex life? You know, and they go, oh, no, I don't need that. I keep walking. I'm going, what do you mean you don't need that? Come back, let's chat. Some do, some don't. And it's, it's like they just go, no, I'm too old for that. I'm done with it. I'm going, I don't want to be done with it. I want to keep going. Yeah, and I'm curious about that because that is something that you hear with menopause comes a drop in libido. Yeah. How do you keep it going? What do you do? <laughs> well, for me, what I do and with my clients is there's a whole series of things I do when, when a woman comes to me and she's lost her libido but would like to have it back because she wants to get back on the horse, so to speak, and wants to have sex and wants to desire sex and even wants to initiate sex. Maybe she's never initiated sex with her partner. So the things that I do is I work at getting you more connected within yourself, so lots of different activities and exercises to get you out of that busy head and get you in your body and feeling in your body. Um, I teach and work with um, activities to start moving the sexual energy because that sort of um, fires things up a lot more. Uh, And um, I teach about the anatomy of the arousal system and every single time every woman goes, oh, my God, I didn't know that. Really? Yeah, there's things that we don't know about the, the orgasm structure and it blows everyone away and so I get people working. So I work on two levels. I work with the physical touch, like to um, get yourself aroused, but I also work with breath and the energy. So it's that combination of different things. And that's what fires people up. 
also working with what's going on in the head, the belief systems. You know, like as we get older, our body's not the same. You know, I'm I'm no different to anyone else. I'll, I'm battling the whole, oh, well, I've got that postmenopausal belly and I, and I absolutely hate it. But it doesn't disempower me. But in moments, I'm just like, oh, yuck, that's horrible. But for some women, that can be a really big thing. And so they don't feel attractive or that if they are having sex, they'll only do it in a certain position that they think will flatter it. You know, like they might mm -hmm. not might not go on top, for example, because everything's shaking <laughs> and tingling. But I always say in my talks, you know, if you're on top of, of a guy in having sex, they do not care. They are very <laughs> happy that they've got someone they're having sex with and they don't care what you look like because they're happy. But <laughs> what goes on in our head, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I, and I've heard that before too. I think that for sure we become maybe a bit more self-conscious because of the way we're, our bodies are changing. And yeah. even before, you know, if ever we gain weight or something has changed about our bodies and we're not happy with something on our bodies, then we feel a lot less sexual, I guess. Yeah, that's exactly right. And And the thing is, you know, I know how I feel about my body right now. It's okay. You know, and I go, oh, it's okay for your age. I'm pretty good, but I still know it's not where I want to be. But if I was having sex, it would be the last thing on my mind because I would be in my body and totally 100% experiencing it. And we've got to move out of the in the head doing sex checklist, checklist, checklist to being in the body um, and experiencing it. So we've got to move from doing to being. Wow. So we, we set up all these armors in our system and patterns, you know, do the same thing over and over again, creates, uh, you know, like you've got, you know, if you vacuum your house up the stairwell, it's like I walk up my stairwell and it's always a bit more worn in the middle because that's where you walk up the staircase with the cat with the um, carpet. It's a little bit the same thing. You, you create that same track that you're doing all the time. Um, it creates armor in your body. So we need to get out of our heads. We need to change it up. We need to do different things. Wow. to open and expand your experience more interesting so yeah we definitely need to get your out head, of our heads <laughs> yeah I know my I mean I've been in those that situation where you're you know you're too much in your head and then nothing works so no, you, you've got to get out of the head, head and and focus on the moment you know bring yourself to the present I don't know what do you suggest like is there something simple that we could we could do in that moment where we notice, hey, I'm stuck in my head. How can I get out of that? Um, well, yeah, I guess one thing that you can do if you're in the moment and that's happening, put your hand on your belly, just below your belly button and send some breaths there because that will ground you and connect you back into your body. And that's pretty easy to do while you're in the middle of sex. You can just sort of slide your hand in there for a minute. Yeah. Put a few breaths down. Um, that can help get you out of your head definitely okay. um but it's 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 working on that mindset before we even get to that point and then if you've yes. got a woman's not experiencing orgasm it's like well what are the reasons that are stopping her because mm. you know we all have the capacity that's the clitoris's sole role is for orgasm and pleasure and yes i know a lot of women don't have internal orgasms um, that's a very actually quite a low percentage that will experience internal orgasms. But through my methods, you probably will learn that because you're going to be more connected in the body more and got the energy moving. But, you know, if a woman's not orgasming, we've got to look at why or if she's only orgasming sometimes. Like okay. when you can orgasm sometimes, well, then why aren't you orgasming other, all the time? So yeah. that's all good stuff. It's, it's head stuff, exactly. That, and that's the way I see it. It must yeah. be a lot of mind work that you do with your clients trying yeah. to get it's, them. It's definitely a combination. I'll do a path. Okay, no libido. Okay, I'm going to do libido coaching. I know what that looks like. What do we need to do with the headspace? You know, look at all the different emotions and look at the belief systems and start working with that. And looking at they've had any trauma because if a woman's had sexual trauma um, or any form of abuse, that's going to affect how they are in relationships. It's going to affect how they are in the bedroom in terms of orgasm or not. You know, some women won't orgasm and it's it's a control thing because mm. their life was out. This is the only way they can control. Um, yeah. And the fear of, of, you know, like an orgasm is to completely surrender and let go, whereas 
to not, you know, you're like hanging on. And so it's about looking at how do we deal with that. So one thing that you didn't mention is that I do trauma work as well. Yes, so it's, that's it's right. that was developed in the States called Havening. Um, it's probably been around for about 15 years and it addresses trauma and anxiety like that. Completely blows my mind how effective it is. Wow. So I can bring that into in at the beginning of coaching. Okay. So when you are working, you can work with clients who have had sexual trauma in the past and, and get them back to feeling yeah, better so in their combination. So that's all part of my intake. So if someone's had sexual trauma or sexual abuse or something, we will work with that uh, first off because when you're, you've had that experience, you are functioning in a flight, fright, freeze mode and there is a level of control in there as well doesn't mean that it always affects you um, to have orgasm, but there is a level of maybe control in other areas. So I always work with the trauma work first to release that. And what this process does, it allows you, well, first off, we look at the trauma and score it out of 10, 10 out of 10 being horrible. Um, I do psychosynetic touch first. So I get the clients, this is one of the movements. This calms the nervous system down. Um, floods the system with um, oxytocin, dopamine and serotonin. They're all the happy hormones. Um, and then we do this um, talk therapy. And at the end of the session, I get that 10 down to a, hopefully to a zero. Zero to two, but might because I'm competitive, I try and get it to a zero. So it means you can look back on the trauma and have no emotional charge. Wow. Works like that. That's I had done myself initially for dental trauma because I had horrible things done to me as a kid and I got really re-triggered a couple of years ago badly and I was just like, that's it, my teeth can fall out, I'm not going back to the dentist ever. Yeah. <laughs> that's, well, that's a bit, bit extreme. <laughs> but that's where I was at, full body and mental breakdown afterwards. And I've got a million tools in my toolkit, but I couldn't sort that one out. And yeah. I had it done on me and at the end of the session I couldn't find the trauma. And over the next few days I would do this and, and I'd be thinking about going to the dentist and I'd have half a smile on my mouth and I'd be like, what the hell? Who am I? <laughs> it was weird. So, okay, I got so learn just, just rubbing your hands in this way. Yeah. It, it will, look, it won't Riding. release the trauma, but this is a great tool for anyone that's having any form of stress or just general stress and anxiety just to start doing this anyway because that will calm your system down. But... Um, you need the talk therapy to actually release the emotional charge fully because it actually unlocks the amygdala when we do the talk talk therapy. So it unlocks the amygdala in the brain. So the flight, fright, freeze mode is switched off. Wow. That's that's amazing. It's amazing yeah. that you can do that. So oh, it blows me away. It's just such a it's such a simple process and it's so potent and so powerful and I've had amazing shifts with clients, you know, from one client having, she, she'd had some sexual abuse, she was in her 30s, wanted to have a baby, she'd have panic, massive panic attacks twice a day. She'd wake up some night in just total fear for hours. And we did the session and I checked in a couple of days later and she said, oh, I felt like I was going to have a panic attack, but I did, did the hands and I did my mantra and it settled. And I said, okay, well, between now and next week when we start coaching for libido coaching, Notice if it happens again, do that and clear it. But then I want you to journal what were you eating, what were you doing, like just to get a scenario to see if it repeated so then I could see what was in there. But when I saw her a week later, she had not had one panic attack. Wow. Not one. And she was like the queen of chill. She was so relaxed. She was like a different young woman. It was amazing. Wow. <laughs> like, wow. I was the queen of chill. I was like, I can't believe this. the shift in her. It was phenomenal. So it's pretty good. I'm really ha happy that I found that because it's such an add-on because the majority is that there's a higher percentage of, of women that have had some form of abuse. Yeah. And yeah, I, I would assume there's there's the abuse, but and then there's just, you mentioned it before, like um, having sex when you don't want to have sex. So, you yeah. know, I think a lot of women have been through that and it can feel a little bit like abuse because you didn't really want it. I guess wow. you can maybe feel like I've been, it, it doesn't feel good when you yeah. didn't want it, but you go along with it anyways. And I can yeah. see how that can be a, a real problem over time for libido and, and forget about orgasm, but, uh, just yeah. libido in general. 
Yeah, hundred percent. So yeah, it's like it's it's a form of non consent. Yeah, you're not getting permission. You might be showing up to say okay because it appeases the situation or the demand, yeah. but you've got a decent bloke there. <laughs> he should be able to tune in and go, oh, she doesn't actually really want it. But yeah. in those scenarios, it's not usually that. or well, they're just not aware. They're not tuning in. So, you know, and, and of course, we are conditioned not to speak out. That's it. That's so it. Don't say, Look, hon, I love you, but I'm just not up for it. Yeah. This woman that I'm about starting work with is like, of course you didn't want to have six sex. You just pushed out an eight pound baby with this huge head. You didn't want anything going in there, and she'd had sti- and she'd had masses of stitches. I'm like, yeah, of course you didn't want anything going in there. You weren't ready. That's it. But there's something like you said. We're afraid to speak up, and we're a lot of women I work with are people pleasers, so they yeah. just want to. They're afraid to disappoint their partner, so they will go along with with that. And I can just see that that is a huge contributor here. Yeah. It's yeah. Just- yeah. yeah yeah so it's it's a lot it's very it sounds like it's very empowering to take your to to get your libido back to be able and then to be able to orgasm um that just must be so empowering when you see women be able to go through that oh yeah 100 yeah. <laughs> i remember just i mean not that long back i had uh an older lady she was in a she was in her early 60s and had completely switched off to sex and she'd had her traumas and things and um, she just started getting getting it. She was just, things just were shifting really quickly with her and I did this process with her. I've got, um, it's, a, it's a process to tap into your erotic self um, and I revamped it and so she was the first one I revamped it with. And at the end of the session, I was like, hey, you finish? She goes, horny. <laughs> and I went, okay, well, go straight to your room. You know what to do. <laughs> because she was just like so alive from it. And uh, wow. she was really fired up. So that was that was really awesome to see see those shifts, you know. And and just even things around belief changes, you know, like that can that can rule how you function in the bedroom. You know, like I had a lady that, the first thing she said to me in the consult was, um, low jobs are disgusting. I was like, oh, okay, we'll just park that one over there for now. And we did our work. She'd, she'd come from domestic violence as well. So there's, she was pretty fractured. So there's a lot of work to do. But when we got around to the beliefs, we were doing some belief changes. And I went, oh, no, hang on a minute. We need to work on that one. And she's gone. And I went, yeah, because she had a boyfriend who was being very patient and gentle and but he was starting to like push a little bit so we did the process and changed that belief and I always ask at the end of it what do you believe and so she said penises are fun and so we had a really good giggle about that <laughs> and um, and then I said to her so when are you seeing him she says in two days I said okay well you know um when you have sex um if you decide to have oral sex it's not like you're going to consciously go oh we're going to have sex oh I'm going to do that it'll just happen seamlessly without any thought at all it'll just unravel and happen and she's looking at me like I'm not sure about that and I said just send me a a, a text with a banana and we had, a, <laughs> we had a bit of a giggle and then three days later I got the text with a banana I'm like yes <laughs> amazing but that's how amazing and quickly things can shift you know yes um, just the beliefs you know another lady having um Never orgasm, turning 40, loved her husband, checked out fully. She she was going through it. She'd been through anorexia, so she wore baggy clothes. Um, she'd been abused by her grandfather. Um, and she played the game but was fully checked out but thought, I'm turning 40. I'd like to see what all the fuss is about if I can actually achieve an orgasm. And we uncovered that she had this belief of almost like who the hell was she to even enjoy sex. So we flipped it. Mm. next session she walked in a t-shirt and a mini skirt <laughs> I'm like what's going on here because if you live locally you can come to my place otherwise we work on zoom and she's just going oh my god like she's doing this the whole time I've gone what she goes you're not going to believe what happened I go what she goes well I saw my husband in the lounge room I went up grabbed his hand led him to the bedroom had the best sex I've ever had 
had my entire life and she's going, I can't believe I did that. And I'm like, oh, and that's a problem for you. How? <laughs> yeah. and she got it. Yeah. You know, and she'd never initiated sex in over 20 years. Wow. So it is a combination of things. And so when I do my consult, it's like, okay, I know you've got no libido. You've told me that, but why? What else is going on? What's all the behind the, the scenes stuff that's led to that point? And that's how I sort of piece it together to know what else what else to work with. Yeah. 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 Because I imagine by the time you get to midlife, there's a lot packed in there. I'm I'm sure there's women that, you know, have gone for maybe years and decades without really having a satisfying sex life. Yes. Possibly. And so there's a lot to unpack, I guess. A lot of Yeah. And then sometimes I get to that point of around the 50, you know, around this this age, 50, 55, and I just go, I need to do something for me. Because yes. you know, they've raised the kids, they've done the stuff for the husband with a with the with their husband, or they've moved on from their husband. It's like, it's my time now. I need to do this for me. And even some women that are single will still come and see me because they know that this has been a little or a big glitch in their in their past, in their history, and they know that they've got to work through it. Yes. Yes. So, then, so you don't, of course, you don't need a partner to do this. This is something you do for you. It yeah, really is about you. It's about yeah. the person coming to you. She wants to get, or he wants to feel better within themselves so that they can, you know, have a satisfying sex life, even yeah. with, even if it's alone, uh, yeah, that they're exactly. getting that fulfillment. Yeah. yeah. And that's important, you know, especially when you're on your own, that you are still being sexually active with yourself and maybe you might not be doing it as much, but it's still really important to to be doing that, to keep everything, like like keeping everything oiled and working. It's like that saying, what is it, Nike? If you don't, or the saying, if you don't use it, you lose it. That's not Nike. You if you if you... it, <laughs> yeah, you that's it. it. So what <laughs> happens if you do lose it, though? What happens... Like what, how does it affect, like, what do you see as the difference between somebody who has, who is good within themselves sexually and somebody who is kind of repressing themselves sexually? What effects does that have on your life? I think it has a big effect. I think it has an effect on your mental, mental capacity, um, you know, potentially putting on a lot of weight because you're sort of hiding things that that's, that's, that's a big one. Um, and you know there's that facade of getting out there and living life but deep down you're actually not Mm. you know it can be depression can can creep in um mental health issues um yeah there's there's lots of different things i mean i can't look at someone and say oh they're having good sex with themselves or they're not i can't sort of determine that no but how much alcohol are you drinking um because that's a great checkout but it's socially acceptable. Yes, yes. That's probably a big one. Not so much smoking these days because, you know, smoking is not as common or as popular, um, but drinking still commonly accepted. And so I look at a lot of my girlfriends, I don't drink. I don't care if people drink. Um, but I look at some of my friends and go, how can they go out every weekend to the pub or to see bands and they're drinking all weekend. It's like I can't even I can't even imagine what that's like. That's not my life. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's that it kind of out. numbs you, I guess. Oh, it's, it's, it does. It's right? a number. It's a number. Recreational drugs on top of that. But you know, yeah. People, you know, a lot of people are still doing as well, but the alcohol is the one that's that's more common. Yeah. And food, I would say too. Food is a great way to numb yourself these days. And again, socially acceptable. So, yeah. So, I mean. Uh, taking charge of your health. To me, it's it's your sexual life and your sexual energy is part of that equation of taking care of your health in general. It, yeah. it goes with it. Yeah, we don't we don't think of it as being important. I, 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 I That's the feeling I get. And yeah. that we don't, we think it's something we can live without. Oh, like you were saying about the ladies that you see, you know, who are postmenopausal. Oh, I don't need it. It's, you know, whatever. I'm fine the way I am. But yeah. really, there's a piece of you that's missing if you're not connected to that 
sexual part yeah. of yourself, right? It's it's a human, very part of, very much a part of our human experience, our sexuality. Yeah, 100%, very much. Um, yeah, and- even post-menopause, even though we're past our reproductive years, we can still orgasm, we can still enjoy a sexual life. Yeah. And if we're not doing it, we're missing something. Yeah. And part of the postmenopausal contribution also is that we lose estrogen. We don't produce estrogen as much or very little. And so what happens to the vaginal wall is it dries up. Mm-hmm. Um, and then that if it then if you have sex and you're not lubricated well, that's gonna that can create pain and things. So it's really important to um here's a free tip get some organic castor oil organic castor oil okay and smear that inside the vaginal wall um if you've not got any problems just do it once a week or twice a week but what castor oil does it promotes elasticity growth and collagen growth in the vaginal wall which we lose when we go into postmenopause. okay okay interesting tip yeah and, but- and- not to do it if you've had like um, unfortunately I can't use it which is really annoying I've had a, um, a hysterectomy and a bladder lift and so they've got those elasticy band whatever they are some sort of band so I can't use castor oil because okay. castor oil penetrates quite deeply so um, yeah but that's that's a really good tip to have just to know that you can do that absolutely no that is really good because that is a common issue i guess a common pain for women who are in postmenopause would be the thinning of the vaginal wall it gets irritated and yeah. and i guess during sex you can use is there a type of lubricant in particular that you would say is oh well i would always just use coconut oil i wouldn't use anything else because you know that area is quite delicate so you just, you want to be really careful of what you use any products you're getting at the chemist or the supermarket is going to have rubbish in it okay. um so you know even stuff you buy in sex shops i just go nuts nah, just just go back to good old-fashioned coconut oil nothing okay. nothing wrong with that. and that's at least quite lubricating and, and it's and it's organic as well that's what okay. you got to look at okay <laughs> that's good to know too because I didn't know that either. I never thought of using coconut oil. So there you go. (laughs) (laughs) I don't think I've used any like, I don't know if you've got it over there, but like KY gel or something like that, um, which probably would have used when I was very young. Yes. No, it's coconut oil. Coconut oil. Okay. That's going to (laughs) happen. Thank you. (laughs) On the shopping list. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Exactly. Good. So, so for women who are in this time of their life and and maybe who aren't experiencing orgasm or having a libido where should they even where should they even begin how can they even begin to work on themselves to to help themselves move forward beyond that um i think it's a little bit of self reflection as to what's going on for them to sort of look at what their history has been and identifying some of the things that could be contributing because it's a start point um, and then find someone to work with. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know if it's something that you can really just work on your own to switch it back on. Okay. Your power is not quite enough because we've got to get ourselves, I believe we have to get connected into ourselves and start realigning the neurological pathways between the brain, the heart and the genitals and get them all connected again. Um, okay so I think that that's that's quite key Um, yeah yeah that's yeah I mean sometimes you can read things and you can it can bring you awareness of things but whether you can actually fix and change Mm -hmm. on on your own I don't know I've met plenty of women that have done their own stuff for a long time and then they come to me because it seems might have shifted a bit but not fully okay okay so it's just, I guess, yeah, it's first recognizing that you do want to, you do, you notice that you're missing something. You notice that you're missing this part of your life. I think a lot of women 
at this point, maybe notice that there's something missing and that they would like to reconnect with themselves, but aren't even sure where to begin. But I like that just reflecting on it, just saying that it's, you know, it's okay. And then, you know, that you probably have lots of reasons and lots of things built up over time that have led you to this. And then, yeah, yeah seeking help, finding somebody who can, who can help you get beyond it. So somebody yeah. like Pauline and, or, I mean, I, I don't know in Canada, what, what, what would we, what we would look for here if we were going to go see somebody in person, but I guess they have sex, sex therapists and. Uh, well, and there's plenty of... around. And I always say to people, you know, Google, Google and re do your research, like check the website out. You know, if someone says they're a tantric teacher and you go to their, their link, and there's nothing on there. It's just a bare, what I would call a bare base website or landing page, and there's nothing there about Tantra. Then they've just gone and done it themselves, and then they think they're going to teach you. Yeah. You know, as I call them, tantric, tantric, tantric cowboys. Um, <laughs> so look at their credentials. Okay. See what, see, look at their credentials. Look at their testimonials. Get a feel for the person, and then. And then you know, send an inquiry. So you know, I, I would suspect that anybody that comes to my my website and sends an inquiry through that they've had a bit of a look at my my website. It's pretty full of it's full. <laughs> There's a lot there. Someone's like, oh, where, where's that going to go? I go, I don't know. Website guy, you do it, <laughs> and I'll let him put it wherever it needs to go. Um, so yeah, I think it's really important to, to have that and to look at the credentials, look at the testimonials. Just read, just read what they're doing, and, and get a feel for them. You know, follow them online because it's easy to follow online. Yeah. See what they're doing online. Um, and you and you work with people over Zoom. You work with them also yeah. in person. You do both. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Predominantly these days it's more Zoom. Yeah. Um, I've got like a very small handful of clients I see locally because I'm local. Um, you know, in my area. But I do interstate expos, so I do. Um, so I live in Queensland, but and about an hour and a half north of Brisbane. So I will go to Brisbane for an expo in February, and then I'll go to Sydney in March, and then I'll go to Melbourne in June. So um, I pick up a lot of clients at those expos. So yeah, I'm always working on Zoom. Don't need people in the room, but um, I had to look at other ways of working with women with internal pain because. I actually do hands-on work for that if they're local and they're open open to it, but um, that seems to be not happening quite as much. But I've developed some other techniques and and products that can be incorporated for women interstate because I can't obviously see them and do hands-on work. Okay, so there are things you can do for pain if even if even to follow you on Zoom would they you would be able to help them with? Yeah, yeah, 100%. yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. This yeah. is, this is really good because I think, yeah, pain is obviously one issue and then, and then it, and the mindset piece. So I just think is so key when it comes yeah. to sex and sexuality and orgasm. And yeah, I think that's, that's a big, yeah. that, big part it's of awesome. it. And then it can be also, you know, if, if you're working with women that, that, um, uh, uh, you know, attracted to other women, then they've got their whole lot of stories that have come through from, from that. You know, yes. how's that been for them? Has it been an easy journey or has it been, you know, lots of shame and guilt and hidden and, and, and other things going on for them because they've got a different sexuality? So there's all those things come into place, place or play rather as well. So yeah. there's just always lots of things to consider. But my whole goal with everybody is I'm passionate about awakening everyone to their full sexual potential because most people aren't. And if you're in a relationship, to have that relationship at a place where you're really fully connected and diving in and connecting in a really deep and intimate way that's going to last you another 10, 20, 30 years, you know, sustainable relationships, that's the word. Okay. So they're the two things that that I'm, I'm I, I, I guess what fires me up to do the work that I do absolutely absolutely I, I I love I love this work I love what you do because I do think it's so needed and so important and I um we don't talk about it 
We don't no. really talk about it. Like it's 2023, like why aren't we talking about it more openly? You know, when I started doing this work, I've been doing this for about 13 years. I remember in the, in the early days, you know, it was a bit sort of like, you know, I go off to networking with all the business people <laughs> and, you know, you do the 30-second intro and they'd be like, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sticking it out, I'm sticking it out. But, you know, people were resistant. And then I was there was a period in the early days where I thought, well, maybe I need to give this away. And I was like, no, actually, it's not me, it's that person. They've got a problem with their sexuality, so I'm coming in, you know, all guns blazing, so to speak, and being out there and speaking about it and it's pushing their buttons. It's like, well, hang on, that's not my problem, that's their problem. Yeah. So I was sort of like, no, I need. I tuned in. I was like, no, I still need to do this work. And I'm really glad that I did because, you know, it's it's been a, a big journey on a lot of levels. Yeah, um, and I'm sure you've helped a lot of people, women and men, through yeah. in this, yeah. That's amazing. Yes. What I'm here to do. Well, thank you for doing it. And before you go, though, I do want to ask you, because I ask all my, all my guests for you, what is the best part of getting older? Not caring as much about what people think of me. Mm -hmm. just being totally comfortable in my skin totally comfortable with who I am and not dimming myself in any way you know dimming my light this is who I am yes um and you either like that or you don't and if you don't well whatever I don't care (laughs) definitely Uh And I totally see this light in you that you were totally owning who you are. And I wonder, I guess, would you have been able to do this work 20, 30 years ago? No way. (laughs) Oh, why? Like I even remember before I did this work, I I stepped, I was was doing admin all my life, you know, from receptionist to exec secretary to personal assistant in corporate world. And I got sick of that up here. I was working part-time in medical and I, I really did not like it. And I left and I went, okay, I'm just going to start my own admin business. So for two years, I did admin for small businesses. And so I had to get out there and network. I couldn't talk to people. I did like, I was like, I, I had to make myself. So I think I was always this person, but I was very suppressed and, and the, you know, like quite shy on some levels. So it's sort of like since I, I would push myself at networking to network and speak to people and it was daunting. Now I have no problem walking into a room with people I don't know. Um, oh, yeah. Or, you know, when I first started speaking at events, I'd be like really freaking out. And now I'm, <laughs> I might have an event I'm speaking at. Like, and there's thousands of people go through the thing and so there's usually several hundred to 300 people sitting around or standing around watching, listening. I might pull out my slides the week before and have a quick glance at them. <laughs> Don't even prepare. It's like, oh yeah, oh yeah, that, oh yeah, yeah. I'm good. <laughs> and I just <laughs> so a lot has shifted, definitely. Yes, and and um, I would think that by embracing your own sexual energy, that would be the one of the wonderful byproducts of it is this self confidence, this this feeling that you have that you can it doesn't matter what anybody thinks i i'm good in my own skin i feel good about yeah. myself and and i think owning your sexuality is a huge part of that yeah 100 percent. i think that's definitely it you know um it's been a journey for me and i mean that's part of what my book's about is my personal journey so people get it get a look behind closed doors so to speak um and some very deep personal shares in there but i do go on and, and talk about other topics and um you know there's there's um things that exercises and activities that people can do as well whether they're single or in a relationship so there's there's lots of things coming together in in the book as well okay well we'll definitely i'll put the link to your book in the show notes as well and how else can my audience find out about you and where can they find you online yeah yeah just my website paulineryland.com okay and um, they jump on there and have a look there's an inquiry form so they can send an inquiry form through and then I go, oh, that's a phone number doesn't seem like it's local. So I'll email back and go, where are you located? <laughs> and then we'll, we'll either, if they're on Facebook, we'll just jump on Facebook and have a quick chat because I always like to have 
about a 15 minute chat conversation with someone initially to see if we're going to be a fit and to ask some questions and then I'll book them into a consult, you know, a proper paid consult and then we do that on Zoom. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So yeah, so I'll put all that information into the show notes so you can contact Pauline and ask her all your questions and find out more about what you can do if, you know, getting your sexuality back on track is important to you. So thanks, Pauline. Uh, I really appreciate you coming on here, talking about this topic that we're all, you know, not talking about enough uh, to put it out there for us and to, you know, to, to rekindle that belief and that, that drive in us that we all need to connect to. I think, especially at this time of life, it's not over. (laughs) It's just beginning. It's a whole other different beginning. Yeah. And it is different now, different to when we were teenagers and in our early twenties very different what we want how we experience it yeah it's all very different but it's it's still good so and maybe even better (laughs) yes yes yeah (laughs) I I like that (laughs) all right thanks for uh thanks for being on the podcast Pauline you're welcome bye bye